follow the Lord. My call to all of us today, the call of the Lord to all of us today is this. Will you follow me? Will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me today? So that's the invitation to each and every one of us. Would you, would you follow the Lord today? Would you, right where you're at today, you think, well, Ben, of course I follow the Lord. Here I am. I'm standing here this morning. Aren't I following the Lord? No, there's something else the Lord is drawing from us. He's, he's, he's calling us. He's saying, step in, lean in this morning to me today. Lord, we lean in today to you. Lord, we've, Lord, even by standing here, Lord, we, we have left all. Lord, to follow you. But Lord, if there's more, we lay it down beside. We lay it aside today. And Lord, we come after you. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross. We follow after you today. We love you today. And we thank you that you called us and you're leading us. Lord, lead us, we pray in Jesus' name.
I want to invite you to find your seat. We're going to take communion here together. We had a few technical difficulties with uh, the live stream, so if you're watching with us now, hopefully uh, uh, it's all working well. And uh, certainly want to invite you, as Scott had last month, just to uh, be a part with us in communion uh, there at the house. I know there's some uh, shut-ins specifically. Uh, you know, I just our, our hearts are extended to you and want and invite you to be a part of this. Uh, I want to challenge you with a little bit of scripture that I've been freshly challenged with as we take communion, and I feel it's uh, completely apropos. Uh, uh, it says in um, Matthew chapter 6, it's right after the Lord's Prayer. In verse 14, it says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And it's a reminder, communion is an absolute reminder of the power of forgiveness that we all walk under. Communion is a reminder of not just forgiveness, it's radical forgiveness, is it not? 
It's radical forgiveness. When we come to the communion table, it's radical. It's absolutely radical. Because it's not just, you know, forgiving that person over there that has nothing to do with me. It's the idea that I'm, I'm taking upon myself, Jesus did, that sin of that person and paying the price for their forgiveness. You know, Jesus, when he's on the cross, what does he say as they're, as they're, as they're nailing him to the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's radical, radical forgiveness. I forgive you so much that I'm, gonna will, I'm willing to pay with my own life the price this forgiveness costs. Because forgiveness costs something, does it not? When we read in Luke chapter 15, um, is, I think it's Luke 15. Uh, no, it's Luke, uh, let me find it here. Uh... Bear with me for a moment. Um, Luke 22. Jesus said, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we have this whole moment of communion being established here in the upper room. And then the next verse says, But behold... The hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. The idea that Jesus is, is, you know, washing the feet and sharing communion with the very ones that, very one that will, will betray him that very night. It's, it's this idea that forgiveness that Christ walks in is radical. It's a radical forgiveness. John chapter 13, um, John 13 verse 35 speaks speaks of this in the body. John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We demonstrate to the world watching world, the love of Christ, by the way we love one another. And I don't know of any greater place where that is particularly seen than in the very area of forgiveness towards one another. If I, if I were to ask a poll in this room, how many people in this room have ever been offended before, every hand would be raised, correct? If I asked for a poll in this room, how many people have been offended in this room at somebody else in this room? To point your finger at them right now. No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> I'm kidding. But the reality is we've all been there. We've all walked that. If you were in your very own family, you're going to have your, your, these issues existing and walking. And where one to another, you're going to have to walk through it. I'm telling you that the area in your life right now where you might be tempted to hold unforgiveness towards somebody, that is the crux of your Christianity right now where God wants to show up in a powerful, real way and demonstrate his love of God not only to you but to the watching world. Not that everybody knows where you're struggling with unforgiveness. That's not, the, that, 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 that's not what's going on here. But the reality is we're, we're called to carry something pretty radical ourselves. And so, you know, today as we, as we take communion, I want to invite you to, to forgive one another. If somebody's wronged you, if somebody's hurt you, said something against you, about you, that has been, that, that, I'm not saying that doesn't need to be dealt with, it does, but something in your heart, the enemy wants to grow. We have to let the Lord in his grace and life wash us, cleanse us, and help us in that very area, to not carry that which the enemy wants to plant in your life. The Bible says we have a debt one to another. We're in a debt to love because he paid the death debt. He paid the debt to our sin. We're called to then love one another and carry that for one another. So as we take communion today, let's be reminded we've been radically loved. We've been radically forgiven. And therefore, with that challenge in front of us we've been saved by such grace I mean man what a mess our lives are who's grateful today for the forgiveness of the Lord amen I am so grateful that the Lord's looked upon my life saw it for what it is 
wicked and sinful, and yet says, Ben, I cover that with my grace, with my love. I want to invite all of you today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't need to be a member here at Christian Fellowship Center, but you need to be a member of the, of the body of Christ to come and be participate in communion today. Mask up. We, uh, maybe I could have a couple of the guys there just uh, separate them out for me. Those, uh, uh, Andy, would you mind to help me out there? I don't know who, Josh or somebody else maybe over here, just, just to separate them, or, or Ryan, some, Ryan could do it just to get them all situated. Get them ready just to, to be handed out. And um, we're going to take some time here. We're going to love Jesus, and we're going to love each other. And it may not be, you know, it may simply be in our heart, the Lord's dealing with an area, and we're just going to say, Lord, I forgive that person. Lord, I forgive my, my sibling. Lord, I forgive my parents. Lord, I forgive my kids. Lord, I forgive that person at work. I forgive whoever it might be right now that the Lord is putting his finger on in your heart. Let's let, let's let, and I'm sure for every one of us, there's somebody, there's something that God wants to do work on. So let's let the Lord do a Holy Spirit work right now in our hearts as we come and take communion. So why don't you come and take, get, get the communion, bring it back to your seats, and we'll, uh, we'll take it all together at the end here. As the Bible says, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And uh, we have broken bread here, representing the, the body of the Lord, which was broken for us, a great reminder of radical forgiveness. Lord, we thank you so much for this bread, Lord, where you were literally broken for us. Lord, we stand in gratitude today, in thanksgiving, and we love you. Let's take it together. He says on the night, the very same night he took the cup, he says, I won't drink this again with you until I come into the kingdom, together with you, and he took the cup and he blessed it, and he said, this is my blood, given for you and this here represents the blood of Christ which was shed liberally, amazingly outstandingly extravagantly for us Lord we thank you so much that you gave it all for us 
Lord, we just love you. We're so grateful for the blood of Christ that covers a multitude of sins. And we say, yeah, Lord, a multitude right here in our lives, right here in my life, a multitude. We love you. Let's take the... I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to worship with one more song. Let's worship the Lord together. You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself in frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me, and I found Amen. Amen. Come with grateful hearts. Amen. And then once you find your seat, I want to welcome everyone to CFC this morning, and it's uh, good to see everyone. Shelly, it's great seeing you. Saw you out shoveling yesterday, out shoveling yourself out of there. Uh, the, I would have stopped to help, but I'm not, I'm not allowed to right now, which is a great excuse. I'm going to wear this thing for many years to come uh, because uh, the Dorn Bicep <laughs> does not allow me to do any uh, shoveling. Uh, the, uh, anyhow, it's good to see you, Shelly, today, and it's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, again, welcome you. If it's your first time visiting with us, uh, you can jump online and uh, fill out a, uh, a little uh, virtual visitor's packet right there, virtual visitor's packet. That way we can stay connected beyond the Sunday morning. And I uh, certainly want to stay connected uh, throughout the week. I want to say a big uh, greeting. I missed you last week, Harrison. I want to say a big greeting to Harrison here this morning. Uh, he's been here for a, a week, and you're heading out soon, right? 
tomorrow. So it's good to have Harrison here. Let's just give it up for Harrison. I don't want to clap for Harrison. It's one of the coolest names I know, to be honest with you. Classic name. Harrison's a great name. Anyways, Harrison, it's good to see you. Good to have you here. I uh, want to let you know that there is Children's Church this morning. Children's Church ages three and up, which is, uh, we're very excited in our home uh, because I uh, want a little warning uh, to Olivia, who I think is teaching this morning. Uh, Sebastian turned three this week. Uh, so uh, a big happy birthday to Sebastian. Uh, you get to go to Children's Church today. You excited? Yeah. Yeah, he's excited. So uh, who knows how that's going to go. Uh, so uh, that'll be fun for them. Uh, anyways, that'll be fun. Uh, it's good. It'll, I'm sure it'll be great. Hey, uh, important membership note for uh, all the members. Next, uh, next Sunday morning, uh, we will have a membership vote uh, for the sale of the property in Richville. I shared about this last week. Uh, Richville Church, they're going to be selling their property. Uh, they have an offer of $100,000 for the property. And the beautiful thing is, uh, when they sell it, they're still going to be able to use the property for the next year. So uh, it's a great uh, situation because the other building down in, uh, down on Route 11 is not yet ready, ready. Uh, though they've had a great year of getting that building prepared. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. But we need to vote on that. That'll be next Sunday. Don't know exactly the details. Probably after the service, we'll have some form of vote for whoever is here. So stick around after the service next, uh, next Sunday for that. Uh, also want to let you know about 21 days of prayer. I think I have a big... Uh, don't show me that one yet. Show the 21 days of prayer if you have the other one, uh, Anna, that one. 21 days of prayer and fasting. 21 days of prayer and fasting. This is unique to us in Madrid because uh, I'm not sure what the other churches are doing. For the past several years, we've been taking the 21 days, utilizing the, the prayer calendar with the other churches in those locations to just pray, to pray for uh, the needs of the, of the body. Kind of came out of Ezra chapter uh, uh, 8, maybe, Ezra 8, 24, where it says... They met by the river Ahava and uh, pr uh, prayed and fasted for a safe journey uh, for them, for their children and their stuff, their belongings. And it's kind of the kind of just came birthed out of that a couple years ago. And I want to encourage all of us just to take some time to pray, to fast something. It doesn't have to be in, you know fasting all of food though. If that's something you wanted to do, certainly uh, uh, you can you know do that with uh, uh, with wisdom. Uh, but uh, I want to encourage you just to pray about Lord. Is there anything? In my life that you'd have me just kind of, you know, pause from in this season to kind of really just give, to, to just rec help my flesh recognize that I am fully dependent on the Lord for everything good. That is where my dependence comes from. I mean, that's what fasting does. Fasting helps just pull, pull us aside all the things that we, that we depend on or think matter as much as we want to focus in on the Lord and the Lord alone. So I encourage you uh, to do that. Um, I do want to let you know that we have some, um, some, prayer, uh, some prayer cards from 2000. Actually, the orange ones are from 2019 uh, when we started that year. The blue ones here are from 2020. Uh, uh, these are some that some of you have filled out. I think Kayla's been handing them out. I think she's got most of who's ever here. Um, but I'll have these purple ones back by the offering bucket. So, Benny, when we, uh, when we break for the children to go out, can you put them back by the offering bucket? And um, you can grab one of those, fill it out later today, uh, fold it up, put your name on it, and drop it in the offering bucket. We'll hold on to that uh, for you until next year. And uh, I opened mine up this morning and thought, boy, the, I'm asking for the very same things. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. Uh, so uh, just growth areas and edges in my life that I've been praying for. Um, so I want to encourage you to just take some time and pray um, daily. I'm going to be, usually I do a video. We've used this, uh, uh, this we've had like a, private prayer group. I'm just going to do it on the CFC Madrid site. I'm going to utilize that site. We're just going to, I'll just do a, just a quick video, probably around noon every day. I'll have one up, up today, uh, most likely a live stream of some sort, very short, four to five minutes of length, kind of giving you some encouragement in the word. Yeah, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, on Facebook. Um, to kind of give you some encouragement in the word. And uh, so you'll leave church today. There'll probably be a video on the way home. I'll do it here. Uh, I'll uh, have a little, little teaching I'll share there. Uh, this morning, that'll be happening. Um, David, uh, David Tullock is going to come, and uh, just as we kind of get ready and kind of as a launching pad, uh, just kind of lead us in prayer corporately. Lead us in a corporate prayer uh, for this season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, we have, I'll announce in a minute, some of the meetings that we have scheduled, but there will also be uh, some other encouragements along the way of prayer. And David just dropped his phone, but that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, excited about this, but we're, we're, we're 
question, obviously what Ben just said, that we want to be people who are praying, but also just the sense of, man, we want to pray together, that this, this matters, right? That we're a body, that we're one, that we're connected, and that our, our devotion to prayer matters, and also our prayerlessness matters. That if we're prayerless, it affects not just us, but it affects everybody. And I mean, I've really been, been just impressed by that, that sense of body life, that sense of that we're together, that in the Bible, when Paul, when people are writing, they're writing to a church, not to an individual typically, but to a bunch of people. And so I'm just impressed for us today just to pray, but also just to really dive into this, that this, this matters, that this is important. I was just thinking of J.C. Ryle's book, I think it's called The Call to Prayer. You can get the whole thing online for free, I'm sure. And he has a quote, and it says this idea of, uh, of this idea of, of sinning will never exist in the heart of someone who's devoted to prayer. This idea that prayer kills sin. And I really, I really believe that. I think that's great that when we're, when we're on our knees, man, the things of the world really start to fall away. And so this morning, I'm just going to ask you, let's just join together this morning. Let's pray as we start this new year. So join with me. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you for this time. We thank you for who you are and what you've done, just for being our creator, our sustainer, our friend, our redeemer, Lord. We just praise you. And Lord, we just look to you in this time. We're eager to see you move. We're eager to see you manifest yourself, Lord. We're eager to see people further than they were at the beginning of this year. And so, Lord, we just come to you with eager anticipation. And Lord, as we enter this new year, we just acknowledge sin, Lord. We acknowledge our frailty, our inability, our lack. And Lord, we come and we stand in awe and we stand in wonder at your amazing ability, Lord, your completeness. And Lord, that you have provided everything we need. Lord, we come and we just ask that as individuals, as a church, Lord, as the body of Christ, as CFC in the North Country here, Lord, that this year stones would be added to the foundation of this church. Stones would be added to the foundation of churches in this area, Lord, that, that the body would be built. And Lord, we just pray that as we come together next year and we stand here on the first Sunday of a new year, Lord, that there would be new members. Lord, that there would be souls who right now are walking in darkness, Lord, who do not know Jesus. And we just ask, Lord, we pray, we seek you, Lord, that next year there would be people who are here, who are in light, who have been transformed by the power of Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come to you and we just ask for forgiveness. We ask that you would just cleanse us, Lord. We ask that you would show us our sins, that we might run from them. We ask to give us power to flee from sin, to free, flee from lust, from doubt, from apathy, from whatever holds us back, Lord, as the body of Christ. We want to be running after you. Lord, like Pastor Ben said last week, we want to put one foot forward and another foot forward, and we want to go further. We want to strive after you. And so, Lord, we just ask, Lord, give us the ability Lord, give us the ability through the word, through the spirit, through the body, Lord, just through the blood of Christ Jesus that we have just remembered, that we've just been stirred up in, Lord. Help us to run the race forward. And Lord, I just ask for addictions, Lord, whatever it may be, Lord, I ask that they'd be free. I ask for this year, Lord, that besetting sins would be free. Lord, I ask that dysfunctional marriages, Lord, would be mended. Lord, I ask that relationships that are broken would be fixed, Lord. We just come to you and we ask for the, the miraculous in our lives and in our families' lives and in those around us, Lord, that you would mend what is broken. So, Lord, we come and we're eager to see you move in our own lives and the lives of people around us. Lord, we come and we just feel this sense of longing, Lord, this sense of stirring this Maybe a quaking, Lord, that you're moving, that you're doing something, that this last year has been strange and it's been hard in some ways, but at the same time, Lord, there is something, there's something going on, Lord. You're on the move. And so, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would show yourself miraculously, that you would show yourself in big ways and in small ways this coming year. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We pray for this church. We pray for Pastor Ben, Lord, for the elders here, that you just help them to guide in the next year, to pastor in the next year, that, that we as a people, as the sheep here, would be better off than we are right now, Lord. So, Lord, we give you this year to come, and, Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We thank you 
for the souls that are going to be impacted. We thank you for the maturity that we're going to see. We thank you for the movement we're going to see. We thank you just for who you are and what you've done. And Lord, that we of the people of God can look forward to a year in which the Lord moves. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah, and on the way in, uh, you would have picked up, you can pick up your 21 days of prayer and fasting, uh, you know, uh, what, do I, what do I call this? Um, directory, but I know what I was kind of, a, what did I call, what's that? Yeah, the prayer guide. This is our prayer guide for this year. A couple years ago, we kind of prayed for some big prayers and some different prayers, prayed for a governmental authority, we prayed for marriages, we prayed for just some different general prayers. Last year, we prayed for St. Lawrence County, we prayed for uh, the different places along the county. Uh, this year, we have our prayer guide right in the middle, uh, right here. I pulled up, open a page 50. Uh, there's, uh, there's Gene Odehout right there. Uh, there's Gene right there. There's Kaylin Ramsey right there. Kaylin's right over there. Your hair is a little longer in this picture than it is right now. Uh, but that just gives you some ideas. I want you to work through this as a prayer guide. Day after day, just begin to pray for, of course, Madrid's in the middle. You can familiarize yourself with that. Um, Potsdam and Canton is in here, but also Moira and uh, Richville's in here as well this year. So we can spend time just seeing faces, praying for people, praying for the body of Christ as, as they relate to this Christian Fellowship Center here in the North Country. And so utilize this as a tool uh, to really pray for people and make it over the next 21 days really spend time in prayer. Another area we can come together is in our, our, uh, our prayer gatherings. Tomorrow night we're going to be right here uh, at church here. Uh, 7 p.m. Wednesday will be at Moira. Thursday at Canton. Monday, uh, the following Monday, will be at the Youth for Christ uh, building in Ogdensburg. Uh, Wednesday night next week will be at Richville. And then Thursday, the final meeting will be at Potsdam. So there's a total of six meetings there that you are welcome and invited to be a part of. I will be at all of them. At least that's the plan right now. Uh, so uh, I'll be at all those meetings. Really excited um, to do that. If you can't make all of them, uh, try to make tomorrow. Try to be here tomorrow that we'd pray for Madrid and pray for the body here and spend some time uh, together here tomorrow. Um, that will be important. If you can't make any of the meetings because either you're uh, not, not, a, not attending large services or for whatever reason you're not here, they will all be available online live. Uh, if you go to cfconline.org, all the prayer meetings will, be ha will have a live component. Uh, it's a prayer meeting. It'll be hard to interact, I think, on uh, part of that, but you'll be able to observe and be a part in that way. Um, but we'll see, how, we'll see how that works. So that'll happen as well. CFConline.org, all, the, all the six of the meetings will be, um, will be live for that. Excellent. Let's have, uh, uh, I was going to, what, what, what did I used to do for the children? Did I have them come forward? Is that what I used to have them do? Anyways, well, we're just going to dismiss the kids today anyways. Uh, let's, uh, let's mask up. And uh, we can live to give as well. The, the offering bucket's in the back. You can give online as well. But let's go, to our, uh, let's go to the children's church, greet one another. Prayer cards will be on the back. We'll come back in five minutes for the preaching.
All right, let's make our let's make our way back to our seats if we can. If we can, I, I, I always feel bad for the person that can't, but uh, you know, the, for those of us who that are able to make it back to your seats, uh, please do. Uh, please make it back to your seats. Before I uh, before we start preaching, I want to pray for a specific need I was asked of this morning uh, to pray for. Um, uh, ben DeShane asked that we pray for one of his friends from his hometown down in the Catskill area. Um, uh, Ben's friend has COVID and has a weakened lung issue and has been put on a ventilator and put in a coma ye- as of yesterday. And so Ben just asked for prayer. I don't have his name, um, but I want to uh, lift them up as I'm sure Ben's carrying that person. And, and uh, Ben is, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, tends to be very active in, in, in the lives of those that he, that he carries in prayer in these areas. So let's pray for Ben and his friend and just ask the Lord to, uh, to touch him. Lord, we just lift up uh, Ben's friend today to you. Lord, this one that's got COVID. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, the healing on this, uh, this man. Uh, Lord, as he's uh, now put on a ventilator and in a situation, a season of, uh, of being put into an induced coma, Lord, I pray that his body would be touched, that he would uh, uh, be able to quickly be uh, taken off the ventilator and find strength and vitality. Uh, Lord, I uh, just take a moment also to pray for others that are just struggling with some physical needs. I do lift up Larry today. Pray that you touch Larry and heal him. Uh, Lord, I thank you, uh, Lord, that you hear our prayer, and uh, we pray for healing for him. And Stacy as well, uh, Lord, pray uh, that you'd help her, heal her, and strengthen her in Jesus' name. Amen. Always a lot of needs to pray for. Uh, one of the beauties that we have as the body of Christ is uh, our, our prayer life. Together is not dependent on what I pray right now. It's on all of us, as David even encouraged us. It's on all of us as we move forward um, to, uh, to continue to lift up corporate prayer here together. But as we're apart in our own private, private areas, to lift up prayer there as well. And that is together. That is the body of Christ, being the body of Christ in that area and in that arena. Amen. Well, we are going to start a new series here. Not sure how long it's going to be. I could preach on it probably for decades. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the series is called Keep the Faith. Keep the Faith. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to start reading in verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned... And have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, for every good work. Continue, Paul writes to his spiritual son, Timothy, continue in what you have firmly believed. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul writes this. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the the faith. I don't know why. I want to take a moment right now. It's not in my notes, and I want to talk to you. There are a lot of young people in this room, right? And I, I'm looking at you, Pee Wee. You know what I'm saying, brother? You know what I mean? Come on now. You know, There's a lot of young people in this room. We're not having children's church right now. I'm not sure if you find me engaging or boring. I frankly find myself boring most of the time, uh, but some of you may get something. I know Carol finds me very boring. Carol's sitting in the front row. You know why? Because She's no longer sleeping in the back. Amen, Carol? Can I get an amen to that, right? This is why I don't go off my notes, because then I start saying things I regret. (laughs) I'll apologize later. Uh, So, anyhow, I want to encourage the young people. I'm going to talk today about keeping the faith, and sometimes we think, well, this isn't for me. This is absolutely for you. And if you can somehow hear beyond just the words of teaching and, and, and what I'm talking about today, if you can get out of this that... There is being something entrusted to you in your life right now. God is giving you something, and it's called the faith, and we'll talk about it right here, that God has a race marked out for you, and it's a marathon race that you're going to be running, some of you, for the next 90 years. God has called you to carry it out with diligence, with faithfulness, and I want to encourage every one of you to take that seriously. 
I'm going to talk today, a little heads up, I'm going to talk about reading the Bible today. Okay, I'm going to tell you the end of my message, reading the Bible. And there's a lot of reasons why we don't read the Bible. I'll probably talk about them at the end today. But reading the Bible is the greatest gift you can give yourself. If I could go back and talk to myself at your age, which my mom did plenty of when I was your age, she, did, she told me a lot, read the word, eat the book. I would go back and tell myself, Ben, listen to your mother. Stop being lazy. Because frankly, in my life, the greatest excuse to not reading the Bible is laziness. That's me. That may not be you, but I'm sure that's some. So encourage everybody. So every young person today, encourage you to lean in. This is for you. This is for all of us. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept finished the race. I have kept the faith. The faith. This is not talking about some quality or quantity of internal belief that you may have at any given moment. Like, it's not this, I have faith, you know, for this situation. I have faith for, I'm not talking about that thing that can be somehow measured with through some emotional barometer or thermometer, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that was handed to Paul and that Paul handed to Timothy. And the Bible says, Timothy, entrust this to reliable men that Timothy handed to others. And guess what? We have been handed. I have been handed. You have been handed. Even today, I'm handing the faith to you. Paul writes in, to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 13, he says this. He said, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Like Timothy and like Paul and like believers for thousands of years, we have been entrusted with something eternally valuable. But as for you, continue in what you have firmly believed. We've been entrusted with a good deposit of the faith. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. This, the key word when it says continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, the key word is not firmly or believed, though that has a lot to do with it. We get caught up with the word firmly because we're thinking, well, I just, how firmly am I believing the word today? I've preached messages where I say, you know, we need to stop doubting our beliefs and believing our doubts and need to start doubting our doubts and believing our beliefs. But we can get caught up with how firmly I, can, I need to believe this. How firmly I need to get into this. No, the key word there, it says, continue in what? The key word is what? That's the key word there. The key word is the what. What is the what? What is the what that Paul is talking about? That's the faith. If I could capitalize both those words, the capitalized, faith capitalized. We've been handed something so amazing. Jude 3 says this, beloved, this is a Jude writing, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to to the saints. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. My challenge to the church in 2021, at the outset of this year, is keep the faith. Keep the faith. The Bible says in Jude to contend for it. And the next verse in Jude, Jude 4 says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that the faith has been under, under attack for thousands of years. For generations it's been under attack. It's nothing new. But here's the deal. Uh, just having faith or just having belief, that ne isn't necessarily what's under attack. Because everybody has belief, everybody has faith. They have faith or belief in something. It's not the idea that you believe in something that's being attacked. It's what you believe in. It's what is your house built upon. I like when David was praying about stones being added to the foundation. And I think he was praying, thinking about members being added and people being added to the body. I'm thinking of foundations and stones as well being added to the foundation of our faith. 
to the faith that we walk in, to that which we stand in, so that we know what we believe and why we believe it. I was talking to one person some years ago who identified themselves as a Christian. And they were joyfully telling me, you know, about their faith. They were sharing with me about the beautiful, how beautiful the words of Jesus were. They were quoting the Bible to me. It was like, you know, how Jesus loved the broken and the unclean and he loved the sinner. And, and uh, you know, it was uh, all true, by the way. Nothing that this person was saying was false. In fact, I was nodding, you know, I was like really enjoying the conversation. I remember sitting there nodding my head like, yeah, yeah, I love the teachings of Jesus too. They're awesome. They're amazing. And then suddenly the conversation took this like, turn, right? It's like, Ugh. And suddenly the person says, I can only, I, you know, I remember the words. Because they, they said, I just love what an example Jesus gave. He was so good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, riding this, I'm, I'm, I'm riding this path with this person pretty well. And they, they said, you know, I mean, I'm not even sure he rose from the dead. But that's not the point. I mean, it's his teaching. And it's what he says and what he did. That's what makes him so beautiful. And I remember my head did that little thing. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, you know that tilt thing where I'm like, like it was hard to even understand. Like, so I go, I didn't even know. What I'm not a one that looks for a fight. If you know me at all, I'm not one that looks for confrontation. Some people are gifted at it, good at it. I'm like, is there any way I can avoid this confrontation? But when somebody says something like that to me that calls himself a Christian, wait, what? What'd you say? And they said, no, they, they, oh, no, no, I just love the teachings of Jesus. And, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 me, me too. I love the teachings of Jesus too. But you said something else about the resurrection? Can we just, because that's kind of important to me. <laughs> that's actually important. <laughs> and he says, well, you know, I mean, no one really knows for sure if he rose from the dead. But that's not the point of why he came. Uh, so I said, hmm. I said, you do realize that you're not a Christian, right? I mean, you do realize that you say you're a Christian, but you're not a Christian. You're not. I mean, like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, pal. But you're not a Christian. Yeah, but the teachings of Jesus, mm, mm, mm. no, 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 man. Please hear me out here, buddy. I need to tell you the truth. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're not keeping the faith. You're keeping a faith, but I don't know what that is. It's a faith of something that's going to blow up in your face. Because if, Jesus, if you're telling me that Jesus is dead right now, <laughs> we got major issues. And so, you know, you know what the person said? Well, we're just going to agree to disagree, you know? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> we agree. I completely disagree. You unfortunately, sadly, and I'm sadly, that's not the only conversation I've had that went that direction. Perhaps you've had some of those conversations in church. Guess what? We need to have those conversations with people because that is how we keep the faith and how we encourage other people to the faith because people are confused nowadays. We're confused. Just so we're clear, I want to just make sure this is clear. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Romans 10, 9, very important, especially in my conversation that I had with this person that I judged as not being a Christian. I said, because if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just so we're all clear, that's Bible and that's what we believe. Amen. That's where we stand. I want to say, if you don't recognize you're a sinner... Repent of your sins. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believe in his life. Believe in his substitutionary death. And believe in the fact that he rose from the dead. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if, we, if he didn't rise from the dead, we're a bunch of morons. Just so you know, that's what Paul wrote about us. That's what he said about us. If he didn't rise from the dead... In the next few weeks, and keep the faith, I'll probably talk a little bit more about uh, sin and atonement, we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. But I do want to say there's a lot of garbage out there today. And as believers, we are stewards of the truth of God. As believers, all of us, as members of the body of Christ. It's not, live, it's not left to just a simple, you know, select few. There are people that understand the word of God so much more than me, and I'm so grateful for them. But I am responsible in my life, in my art, to know what the Bible says and to be a steward of the truth in that. If you're making stuff up about God... 
or you follow a teacher that you found on the internet who is making stuff up about God, you better be very careful. You better, you better really be very careful. So, a good question, where do we find the faith? I'm not quoting like it's somehow weird or bad. I'm just saying this, this, these words, these capital words, where do we find the faith that we're called to continue to keep? Well, let's read on what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And what I love about this scripture right here is you kind of see the formation going on at, the very, at this very moment of the word of God. In, the, in a way, the canon of scripture, the canon of scripture is that which is accepted as the word of God, the sacred book of God, the sacred writings. So the first thing he mentions here is Paul's teaching. Paul's saying, here's my, hold on to, um, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Paul's saying to Timothy, hey, Paul, hey, Timothy, I'm the one who taught you. Remember what I said. Remember, remember the, the, the things I spoke to you. Remember the things I've, I, the Lord's called me to be, a, uh, to be an apostle unto the Gentiles. Remember that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I don't know if I have this scripture there. I do. Paul said this to the church at Corinth. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, and uh, which to you, which you received, and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless... You believed in vain. So Paul's basically saying, hey, what I've taught you, what I've, you know, what I've taught you about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the apostles have taught you, hold on to that. It's funny, 1 Corinthians 15 then moves into just discuss about the resurrection of Christ, which is really awesome. Anyhow, second thing he says there to Timothy is he says, hold on to the sacred writings. And what is he referencing? He's referencing the Old Testament scripture that they had at that moment, that they, that they walked in at that moment. But here's a fun question for all of us, and maybe not for all of us. I just found it interesting. And, uh, you know, I want to be as useful as, I po- useful as possible as I preach. But when does scripture become scripture? Because the very words that Timothy is reading at this moment is, in fact, scripture. Isn't that pretty beautiful? It, it, be, it is, in fact, a sacred writing, a personal letter to Timothy. When does it become scripture? And that's what's called the canon. My simple answer is this, and it's very simple. I'm not going to get into the, the study out the canon of scripture. Books, people, books, you know, cl- complete classes and, you know, in high-level doctorate programs you can study about the canon of scripture that I haven't studied. But I'll say this. Scripture became scripture the instant it was written. The instant that was written, it became whew, the, it, was, it was the inspired word of God. It wasn't once that became recognized by some body of men. God does not need man to validate that which he speaks. It is the word of God. God doesn't need man's opinion or recognition in order for it to be official. Let me talk for a second about the Bible. This is the word of God. 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. I don't know why, but if you multiply 3 times 9, it equals 27. I always find that kind of interesting. It is what it is. Uh, very, very fun. In the, in the book, there are 22 books of history, 5 in the New Testament, 17 in the Old Testament. 18 books of prophecy, 17 in the Old Testament, 1 in the New Testament. 21 letters. As we talked about, some are to the church, a whole church and a city. Some are to individuals. Five books of poetry and wisdom. It's written by 40 authors over a time of about 2,000 years on three different continents and three languages. And through it all, the Bible is extraordinarily harmonious, inerrant, perfect, harmonious with itself. And these books are universally accepted by the church, universal around the world, and have been for thousands of years. And here we have the word of God today that we can read that is in our hands, in our language. I'm telling you, we are blessed. We are incredibly blessed. The very thing that can shake this world is in the palm of my hand and your hand, and you can read it. It's amazing. What a gift. Our own statement of faith at Christian Fellowship Center says this. It says, the scriptures... The Old and New Testaments are verbally inspired by God and are the infallible rule of faith and conduct. The Old and New Testaments in the original language, original languages inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. 
Now, the word for scripture is used over 50 times in the New Testament. And most of the references are references to the Old Testament, as it's, you know, uh, shared and dealt with. For example, Jesus is teaching the two guys on the road to Emmaus in the, in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 24. And Jesus, it's speaking about what he says. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I do want to say, because it's, again, I, I think it's a big deal. The scriptures, they outline our faith and conduct. Uh, but at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, they are completely a big arrow pointing to Jesus Christ. That's the scriptures. Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees, he said, you study the scriptures because you think in them you can inherit eternal life. But I'm telling you today, they are that which testify of me. You're missing it. It's not like we look in the scripture and somehow find uh, our conduct, which a lot of the people do, but miss Jesus Christ. If we don't see Jesus in the reading of the scripture, we're, we're, we're reading it wrong. We're, we're, we're looking at it in the wrong way. Peter references the contemporary New Testament writings, specifically Paul's letters, when he writes about Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. This is the Apostle Peter, guy I mentioned earlier, who Jesus was a fisherman. Jesus said, Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter followed. Of course, he denied Christ and loved, you know, all that stuff. We know all about that. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our bro- beloved Brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks of them in these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Just side note, what's kind of funny is if you read the book of like First and Second Peter, I find some of the things Peter says hard to understand, but that's just me, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but he's writing about Paul, some of the things Paul writes are hard to understand, you know, a uh, little, uh, little, you know, competition they had between the two of them, apparently, anyhow, I'm just kidding. And then he says, there are some things into them which are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. What is Peter saying? He's referencing Paul's letters as scripture. People twist, the, people twist his writings as they do the other scriptures, meaning that, that Paul's writings are, in fact, scripture. Right in front of our very eyes, even as we read Timothy, we see the, we see the formation of the word of God. And that moves us into some important doctrines regarding Scripture and as it relates to us in keeping the faith. Let's read on in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The doctrine I want to spend some time today talking about, the, the faith doctrine I want to talk about today is simple, the simple authority of the Scripture. The doctrine of the authority of Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Right there is the doctrine of the authority of Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out by God. King James Version says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The New Living Translation says all scripture is inspired by God. And the NIV says all scripture is God breathed. All scripture. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't, we don't get to, you know, draw, you know, underline some things and cross out other things. We don't get to do that. It's not up to us. It's divinely inspired. It's authoritative because God is the ultimate authority. If you're a Christian, you must believe that the Bible is authoritative. It is actually an unchristian view to have to view the Bible as not authoritative. The Bible is called many things. One of the things the Bible calls itself is the Word of God. It's the thing that the Bible calls itself. What God, when God speaks, it carries with it. It has an intrinsic authority carried with it. It's the Word of God. If you were to hold an idea that when God speaks, it's not authoritative, you are operating well outside a biblical worldview. And in fact, will be headed down the pathway very quickly of not keeping the faith. Because you are are not taking God's word as being authoritative. You're looking at it with 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 a pen or a way to cross it out. What do we mean by authority? And the reformers called this uh, sola scriptura, in scripture alone. That scripture is the church's sole authority, and it's the ultimate determination for doctrine, for practice, for faith, for worship, 
and for ministry. There is no other authority equal to Scripture. There's none. Scripture. Scripture speaks of no authority, only of itself. In fact, if there was another authority that Scripture needed to validate Scripture as being Scripture, it would no longer be the ultimate authority. It would actually lean into another authority to say, well, I need that authority to tell... No, Scripture is the ultimate authority. In the New Testament, in Galatians Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes this. He He said, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, Paul says. Wait, wait, just just so I'm clear. There isn't another one, but you're uh, to another track here. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Don't let anyone mislead you. There is only one authoritative truth, Paul says. I've preached it to you, and don't even let me tell you anything different, because that is the truth of God. Paul recognizes even in our own, even in our own flesh, Man is able to distort and twist the truth. That is why for all of us, the gospel needs to be in our hands, in our hearts, and in our minds, and in our knowledge so we know what truth is. Sad reality that we fall into, that people fall into. I'm not saying we, I'm saying we as a culture. You know, that's where, you know, uh, people can fall into cults, being led astray by people, or, or a sect with cultic practices, or, or other world religions. It starts seemingly innocent. Perhaps even the Bible itself is seen as an authority, but not the authority. So it's, yeah, well, it's one of the authorities, but, you know, there's this teacher over here, and they have a special authority. They've received special revelation from God. And they've looked at, at, at this as, as a teacher, as an, as an authority as well. I couldn't help but think about my visit at one time. I visited this, uh, uh, this place called the Smith Family Farm. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Smith Family Farm. Smith Family Farm is found in Palmyra, New York. And uh, I, was, I, w- I went there, I visited there with my cults and world religions class because it is the homestead of where Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, uh, was raised. And in fact, I walked through the sacred grove where Joseph Smith met with the angel Moroni on multiple occasions who gave him on golden tablets the secret writings, what we know as the Book of Mormon. Many people in our day believe that Mormons are Christians. I want to tell you that Mormonism, Mormons reject the idea of sola scriptura. They don't believe in that. They reject key aspects of Christianity, including what we're talking about today, including what I talk about Jesus and who Jesus is. For the Mormons, because they were led astray, they actually hold on to four sacred works. They hold on to the King James Bible, which is the only translation that they'll allow themselves to look at. But they also hold on to three other things, the Doctrine and the Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Book of Mormon, which are all held in equal authority one to another. And because of that, some of the writings and the theology that becomes in the study of the faith, they've diverted, as Paul even said, they've caught a different gospel. Even if an angel shows up and tells you that, you know, so they, they, uh, they believe that Jesus was real. They believe that Jesus is a God, lowercase g, just like we all can be gods ourselves. In fact, if, you say to, if a Mormon says to you, well, I believe in God, they actually, they actually aren't saying the same thing as you. You actually have to say, well, what do you mean by God? Because somebody says, well, I believe in God. Well, what do you mean by God? Are you believing the one true God? The, the creator of all things, the one who has always been and always will be, who's existed before the creation of time, he's existed before it all, the created it all, as Christians believe. But Mormons, and I'm picking on them today because I'm trying to show us an example of how easy and, and whole groups of people can be brought into this thing. And, and the truth is, the internet is filled with good Mormons that are evangelizing people and Christians fall prey to 
to Mormon theology because they're listening to a nice person talk on the internet. But Mormons believe God, when they say God, they believe God was, in fact, a, he's an exalted one of us. That he was on a different planet at a different time, and he, became, he was raised to an exalted state of godhood, and they put him now on this planet in charge of us. That's not who we worship and who we believe in. But the sad thing is, if we, can get, if we get caught up in these things and we don't know the word of God, we can be led astray. Church, I want to encourage you, get in the word. It has authority in our life. Paul said, even if an angel comes and tells you another gospel, let's be keepers ourselves of the faith, to know what the faith is. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, speaks of the book of Revelation. It says this, it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. It's intense. That's speaking specifically of the book of Revelation, but it absolutely covers a principle that you can read through the whole book, the whole Bible itself. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says this, Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. The word of God is the final and ultimate authority. That is why men of the faith like John Wycliffe and Jan Hus and Martin Luther fought for the authority of the scripture. You study any of those guys, you see what they fought for was the authority of scripture because so much, so much damage was being done in the name of Christ. Still is being done in the name of Christ. And it's outside of biblical authority. And let me say this, the reformers weren't trying to knock all authority down. Only authority that claimed to be on the same footing as scriptural, scriptural authority. In the church, in what we have, there is delegated biblical authority to an authoritative governance where elders are called to teach, shepherd, lead, and pray for people. That's an authority that the Bible gives, the Bible commands, and the Bible leads out. So, that, so we have the authority of the local church. We have that. But it's not on the same plan as the ultimate authority of Scripture itself. Church authority submits itself to biblical authority authority. Just so you know, I think it's important for us to know, because it's it freshly, we worked on this last year, what do we believe as a church about biblical authority? I'm going to read to you from the church bylaws. I don't have this up here. I'll just read to you from our church bylaws. The gospel is the revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that revelation is most clearly and authoritatively communicated through the Bible. We therefore make the following affirmations as a church this is, this is the affirmations we make. Number one, we affirm the Bible as the final authority for the faith, doctrine, conduct, and morality of the followers of Jesus Christ. And next week, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the doctrine of the sufficiency of the, of, the, of the Word of God, of the Bible, of Scripture. And we'll talk about it's sufficient for us in, in, our, in our faith and practices. We'll talk more about that next week. Number two, we affirm that these articles of faith were generated from careful study of the Bible and are intended to communicate the truths of the Bible. Number three, it is the Bible that speaks with final authority concerning the truth we need for godly living. And then number four, for purposes of Christian fellowship Center doctrine, practice, policy, and discipline, the Board of Elders is Christian Fellowship Center final interpretive authority on the Bible's meaning and application. What does that mean? It means if, if we see something in Scripture and it's like, man, I want to I wanna talk about this, you bring it to the group of elders and say, hey, brothers, what do you think about what I'm reading here? Because I'm, I'm, I met with an angel last night who told me that Buddha is the only way. So is that, is that good? Well, let's look at the scripture and what the scripture says. And we'll go to Galatians chapter 1 and we'll say, even if an angel appears to you and says that another follow another gospel, we'll say, you are in the wrong here. Yeah, but maybe that was talking about, here in this church, we believe this to be true. We believe the gospel to be true and that there is no other way into, into salvation through, and than Christ Jesus and him alone. We are Bible people. We believe the Bible to have ultimate authority in our lives. To trust God's word is to trust God himself. To obey God's word is to obey God himself. To mistrust God's word is to mistrust God himself. We take it that seriously. 
One of, the, one of the things I've loved even about this year, specifically with the men of God that I walk with in the, on, the, on the board of elders that are, I don't know how many of us there are, 14, 15 guys. I'm not sure how many guys are on the board. Somewhere in that range, right? But we'll begin talking about stuff that the Bible says and say, well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And man after man after man after man, studying the word of God to see what the Bible says and bringing it back and submitting what they read in the Bible, what they see in the Bible. And as a group of men talking about these Big issues, big needs that we need to walk through in 2020. And it's an honor to carry that. But I'll tell you this, no man has a greater authority than this. We love this. This is our final authority. This is what we're in. So what does that mean for all of us? Very simply this. Read the word. Read the word. If we truly believe it's God's authoritative word... Why wouldn't we be reading it? Why would we be leaving it on the shelf? God has literally given us his word. And it's a privilege to read it, to have it, to study it, to look at it. Read it. I, 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 uh, I shared this a couple years ago. I'm going to share it real briefly with us now. Five reasons why we don't read the Bible. Five reasons why we don't read the Bible. I have them listed up here. I'm sure there's more. But I list, these are things I hear. These are things I hear. Number one, I don't know how to read. Sadly, I know this is, this is a real thing that people struggle with and, have, and do struggle with around the North Country. Some people really struggle with reading. I don't look down upon this. I don't, I don't, you know, it is what it is. But there are ways to read that aren't necessarily visually reading words off a page. You can read audibly. You can listen audibly, and that'll be argued, I know. But you can listen audibly. I've mentioned before the, the, the app I love, uh, Dwell app where you can actually uh, download that app. And uh, my favorite reader is a guy named Felix. He's like a South African accent. I just Because that always sounds, the Bible sounds more powerful in an accent. Am I wrong? You know what I'm saying? Wish I could speak with an accent. That's why I got to go to another country. And then I ask people, do I sound powerful in this country? They're like, nah, not really. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. But you can listen audibly. You can listen audibly. They're great audio versions. People, people may laugh at me for this, but if you don't know how to read, I don't know how to read good. What is that? What, I always say that wrong. I don't know how to, I, anyways, I won't joke about it, <laughs> but I don't know. I, my English is awful, to be totally honest with you, but I love to read the word. I love to read stuff, but here's something you can do. Get a children's book. Get a book that, 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 that shows you some some stuff with pictures. With our kids, we do different things. We do the Jesus Storybook Bible, which we really like. Uh, we, were, we pulled out this week. Benny had his old, like the covers ripped off, the old Action Bible, because uh, Leo's getting into like some action comics. I don't know if anybody's read the Action Bible. Everybody wants to turn a head to when like somebody's head gets cut off. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to look at that picture. Uh, you know, when Goliath, let, let's see if this is accurately described. And uh, so we, we just love the Action Bible. But there are ways that you can read the Bible and not necessarily... Uh, have to have a great comprehension of reading. So I want to encourage you in that. Number two, I don't know where to begin. Well, there, you can ask me where to begin. I would certainly recommend uh, starting in a, in a book like the book of John. Uh, that would be a great book to start in. Any of the Gospels, frankly, I think is a, gr is a great place to start, at least uh, beginning to dig into the Word. Don't start in the book of Leviticus. That would not be enjoyable for you. I actually, not even, you can read, you know, maybe the first you know, the first few chapters of Genesis to kind of get you started, but I would move quickly to the New Testament and read some stuff in the New Testament before you, you know, really, really dive into the, you know, to the, to the, to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, th those would be a, a little different. Um, um, start with a 30-day reading plan. Get through some of those things. Uh, number three, I don't have time. Um, yeah, we use this as an excuse. It just doesn't work. I I'm sorry. It just doesn't play. If you have time, to do some of the stuff you have time to do, you have time to read the Word. If you, if you can watch a TV show, you have time to read the Bible. It just is what it is. I hate it because that's a challenge to me too. I'm, I'm so busy today. Well, I'm going to sit down today and watch a lot of football today, frankly. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm going to do today. <laughs> if I have time to watch football, I have time to read the Bible. Time to get it in. Manage your schedule well. Have somebody keep you accountable. Read it with other people. Start a daily to good discipline of reading the Word. Number four, um, I don't understand it. Yeah, welcome to the party. A lot of things I don't understand. I read something like, I don't get it. I call Pastor Rick. Hey, do you know, do you, do you know what this means? You know what I mean? He, says, he might say, I don't know. He'd call Ryan. So then I'll call Ryan. You know what I'm saying? And uh, just did that for you. You know, so, hey, what does this mean? At the end of the day, 
There's stuff that we don't understand. Write it down. Ask questions about it. That's part of the fun of reading the Word. What does this mean? What, is, what do you think about this? Well, this is kind of a scripture kind of, oh, this challenges me. Maybe you don't want to know what that means, because if you really knew what that means, it means you have to change something. You know what I mean? But it's good to kind of d- dig in and dive into that stuff. Meditate on it. Ask questions of the scripture. What does it say about Jesus? And finally, an excuse or a reason why we don't read the Bible is simply this, I don't want to. And that, 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 that just needs to be repented of. Because that, that, that's our, we're given into our sin, our own laziness. You know, there's a lot of things I don't want to do, and I don't do them. I end up doing the things I want to do. Right? So let's challenge our, let's ask the Lord for a want to. Let's get before the Lord and say, Lord, I repent of having a not want to. Give me a want to. Help me, stir me, challenge me, grow me. A lot of things I, I mentioned. Uh, I, on the back, on the, um, I have this. Uh, we uh, printed this out. Uh, five-day Bible reading program. Uh, this is, uh, you can re- read through the entire Bible or just the New Testament in 2021. It has, um, you know, all the days here um, or all the weeks that you can check off here. And then every day you can do the little checkbox if you like the checkbox system. Totally recommend it. We did this as a family for a while, uh, reading through the, the different things of the Word. It is chronological in the, in the Old Testament outside of the book of Job. Job's kind of this, you know, kind of an interesting book, uh, most likely written uh, uh, before uh, the book of Moses. Uh, you know, the, those books were written. Job exists. Job was there. Uh, it didn't exist. It wasn't like before Genesis. Job existed. I'm just saying the book was written. But it's put, it's put in later. So usually I'll read like the first... 10 chapters of the book of Genesis, and then dive into Job. I think this puts Job right at the end if you want to read it through chronological. Just a great way to read the Bible. This is one of many. If you go on to, uh, if you go on to, um, uh, if you go on to version, and, uh, which is what I, uh, what I download, you can, you can, um, I, I do this one called the Solid Life Reading Plan. It's read through the Bible in a year, but I end up, I try to double up and triple up if I can. Uh, but there are plenty of opportunities and ways to read through the Bible. And so all those, there's so many opportunities for us as believers. Let us be faithful and jump into that. Amen? I, wanna, I hope I encourage you today. I don't even have a good landing, so I'm just landing the plane hard right now. Let's stand to our feet. You know, the hardest time to land a plane is like the last six feet. They just say, they just say um, what's that? Did I do anything else? Did I miss something? Tell me, Josh. What are, oh. oh, did I miss something here? Oh, yes. Uh, Josh wants to let everyone know the, um, the steps are very careful as they exit. They're wet and possibly slippery. So hold the handrail when you go down the steps. Uh, we don't need you to fall. And um, so says the word of Josh Card. Uh, so uh, the, uh, which has an authority here in the midst. So anyhow, but be careful. I want to encourage everyone as you go to stir yourself, to stir one another in the word of God, uh, to look at the word, even when you open the word today afresh, open it as it's the word of God. This is the authority under my life. Man, this is good stuff for me. God's going to feed me through this. and Give me this day our daily bread. Amen? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the word that you gave us. Lord, that we have this delivered to us, and we've been entrusted with this deposit in us, and we want to guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Lord, keep us faithful to truth. Lord, that where we are all tempted at different places to divert and go this way or go that way, Lord, I pray that you'd help us Walk through um, well uh, your word and your teachings, I pray. Lord, give us strength. Give us grace as we go today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with the peace of God and the life of God. May he strengthen you and your family this week. Be blessed. Oh, it's good.